Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. Episode 47, Cattle vs. Elk at Point Reyes National Seashore. Point Reyes National Seashore is the site of a conflict that is typical on U.S. public lands. It's European-style agriculture versus indigenous land management, private profit versus public benefit, civilization versus wildlife. Elsewhere, it's logging versus forest, mining versus mountain, or green energy versus desert. And this podcast has been and will continue to pursue those important stories, too. In this episode, our guest is Laura Cunningham, California Director of the Western Watersheds Project. Laura grew up in the Bay Area, and she studied zoology, paleontology, botany, and resource management at UC Berkeley. She traveled extensively around the state doing wildlife biology work and surveys for California Fish and Wildlife, the U.S. Geological Survey, the Bureau of Land Management, and various universities. She is also the author and illustrator of the book, A State of Change, Forgotten Landscapes of California, a beautiful and engaging volume on the state's natural history. Podcast listeners might remember Laura from episode three back in April 2020, when I interviewed her and Kevin Emmerich of Basin and Range Watch about defending desert habitats from industrial energy development. On December 17th, 2020, Laura and I talked about how her art led her to conservation work the ecology and history of the Point Reyes area, the establishment of the park, including how ranchers accepted buyout money but then never left, how elk died during a recent drought due to being fenced off from water supplies, how the Park Service is sacrificing elk and their habitat to cattle and agriculture, the ecological damage from ranching and dairying, floristic succession in damaged and recovering landscapes, the possibility that elk will be killed in the future if they, quote, infringe on cattle pasture, where we are in the decision-making process about the park's future, and the effects of the Woodward Fire there last summer. Laura also provided a list of online resources for learning more about the situation and how to get involved, and I've included those in the show notes. And shout out to Dr. Dream Chip of Portland, Oregon for the music you're hearing. See show notes for how to follow their work. If you appreciate this podcast, please subscribe and share episodes on social media. If you're watching this on YouTube, please like and comment. To offer support financially, you can make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash colibri or become a member at patreon.com slash colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. Visit RadioFreeSunroot.com for more details. Now here is my conversation with Laura Cunningham of the Western Watersheds Project on the subject of cattle versus elk at Point Reyes National Seashore. We're here today to talk about Point Reyes National Seashore and the different controversies that have been going on there. I've heard little bits and pieces over the years, but I don't know the story well. But I guess that you've been working directly with this through the Western Watersheds Project? Yes, correct. And maybe you could give us a little background, because I know that you're both a scientist and an artist. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, I've always just been keenly interested in the natural world of California and even wrote a book about what California was like before... European contact with um, Native American management. It was a land of grizzlies and salmon runs and herds of tule elk and native bunch grasses. So just a self-taught artist and tried to research what scenes would be like, such as, you know, what San Francisco was like before the city and then did paintings of that. So, but 
after the book project that was published in 2010 by Heyday and Berkeley and actually just went out of print, the second edition. It's a phenomenal book, by the way. Just incredible. Well, thanks. Yeah. And the the new head of Heyday thinks it's too expensive to do a third edition, so it's gone as a book. But I have the rights to the material, and I'm going to um, upload the manuscript and all the text and illustrations to a new website in the future. I'm working on it. Um, takes a while to, you know, digitize all the all the images for a web content, but it'll have all the chapters and it'll be free as an online distance learning curriculum. So oh, that's, that's the, wonderful. The next, yeah, that'll be the next um, evolution of the book. So, and it'll be kind of fun for me because it gets to have no editing. Like I get to be the editor. A lot got cut out of the book. And so I'm going to put a lot back in from the original manuscript since there's no limit on a website. So after the book project, I came to realize that a lot of our native wildlife and landscapes were in peril. So uh, in 2018, when a position came available at this nonprofit conservation group, Western Watersheds Project, I thought, hey, you know, I can move on from just being an artist naturalist and try to really be a conservationist. So that's how I actually got involved in the Point Reyes issues was taking this position, and then a lot of it actually has been involved deeply in trying to protect the seashore. Can you tell us a little bit about what the area is like, uh, and, like the flora and the fauna and the geography? Yeah, it's like a pretty rare coastal series of peninsulas with bays and estuaries, and a lot of it used to be coastal prairie, which was a very beautiful bunch grassland right on the Pacific coast, right up to the sea cliffs, right behind the dunes, deep rooted, um, full of wildflowers. Um, I like to tell people now it stores a lot of carbon in those deep roots that go down six feet, to some of these bunch grasses. So it was quite a lush um, open grassland, but it had coastal sage scrub, north coastal scrub full of blackberries, coyote brush. Then there were some forests of redwood and dug fir in places too, and um, yeah, it's a, actually it, and and I should point out, it is a biodiversity hotspot because I've since learned in the past two years it has more rare plants, state and federally listed animals than almost any other part of California. I mean, it's just this long list of rare plants. Um, there's endangered coho salmon, steelhead trout. There's something called the California freshwater shrimp, which I never even knew about. Uh, Western snowy plovers on the beaches. I mean, the list just goes on and on. I mean, the state just listed the tricolored blackbird, which apparently nests in marshes in California. So quite a diversity of life. And I think that's part of the reason that uh, the park was nominated to be a national park um i mean as late as it was 1972 that the national park service actually purchased the land from the ranchers and made it into a national seashore but that's actually the root of the problem too is that the land originally came from ranchers or yeah you know it's an interesting history i uh, we we've been piecing together the history i mean it was originally Miwok tribal areas, um, and there was a village a little bit inland. Petaluma is actually an, a Miwok word, and it was a large village. And so the Point Reyes area was more of a hunting and gathering area. Um, and of course, Francis Drake in the 1500s apparently landed at Drake's Bay, um, and his men got out, sailed in their you know small dinghy from the, the sailing ship and described this very well pastured area full of large fat deer and those are apparently the the elk because in England they have red deer which is very very similar species to our North American elk so as early as 1500 eyewitnesses were describing large herds of elk 
on what's now Point Reyes. But the lush coastal prairies made very good grazing land. So in the Mexican period, um, the area became ranchos for different um, Spanish ranchers. that, And they didn't have fences. They just brought their longhorn cattle and grazed. And then the American period happened. Um, Americans came, bought a lot of these ranchos, and it was quickly found that dairy cattle did pretty well in these lush coastal bunch grasslands that remained kind of green well into the summer. So the area was dairies and some beef ranches from, you know, early 1900s and um, until today. But the and here's the controversy, though. And I, and I didn't know this growing up in the Bay Area. I actually did not know this until beginning to work with this environmental group and you uncover this history um, that's not well reported in the media in the Bay Area. So, you know, thanks, Calibri, for interviewing on this because it's more people need to know this. But everyone agreed, well, this should be a, a national seashore, which is, you know, just the equivalent of a national park on a coast. And there's a couple of national seashores on the East Coast, but this is the only national seashore on the West Coast because it's it was just thought to be so amazingly beautiful with, you know, these Tomales Bay and different creeks full of salmon pouring into the ocean. And then the, the peninsula with the lighthouse, you could just see this vast vista of this huge long beach stretching north. I mean, it's just a, one of the more stunning views on the coast. So the, the um, federal government got a whole pile of money together. Congress passed legislation um, and funded buying out all these beef and dairy ranchers, about 12 of them. And uh, they agreed to take the money. I think some of them didn't want to go, but they all took the money. And it was $57 million dollars in 1960s and 70s dollars. Wow. So we've had some calculations done that that's more like 130 or 40 million in today's dollars. But so each rancher took something like 10 million dollars. You know, it might have been five here, 12 there, but each one of them got, you know, millions of dollars to get, you know, basically make it a park. And the agreement was that they would move their cows and operations and buy private land, which is, there's plenty of good dairy land in Marin and Sonoma County on private property. So a few of them did, and they were also in the enabling legislation, which formed the seashore, given very generous amounts of time to move, 25 years, and they could... Um, like a reservation of use, they could stay for 25 years with their $10 million, right? And then move on or the death of their spouse, you know? So they were given a generous amount of time. But here's the problem. They didn't go. They decided that it was really kind of nice to stay in these lush ranches and dairies. And so they lobbied very hard Congress to say, well, we actually want to stay and just keep renewing a lease. And they unfortunately got Congress in the 70s to do a couple of amendments to the enabling legislation, which is very clear, by the way. I mean, you read it and it says, the seashore shall be made to restore um, the natural resources, wildlife, and for the enjoyment of the people. That's the mission, that that's like the goal of the seashore, to restore what used to be this beautiful wild area. So, unfortunately, these amendments, they didn't say, oh, yeah, the ranchers can stay, but they kind of clouded the technicalities of the leases. And so it, it changed this 25-year life lease and then go to, oh, well, the superintendent can have the discretion to just keep renewing these leases every five years or 10 years. So that's a sticking point now that's actually even legally kind of vague because apparently it's okay for the superintendent every five years, they just rubber stamp a new lease. And this has been going on since the seventies 
And they've been getting away with it until the big drought of 2014, that epic long California drought. So they had, I think it was, um, I can't, I'm terrible at all the years, but it was in the 90s, I think. Don't quote me on this, but in decades ago, tule elk were reintroduced to a preserve in Tamales Elk Reserve. Might have been 1978 even, pretty early, because that was the goal, to restore the wildlife, the native wildlife, to Point Reyes National Seashore. I like to think of it like this could be the Yellowstone of California. You know, herds of elk, there even used to be pronghorn there. Um, There's still mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes, foxes, badgers, which you can regularly see. It's a great place for wildlife viewing. So they reintroduced a herd of tule elk, built a big eight-foot high ugly fence to exclude them from the cattle pastures because the cow, cowmen, cattlemen were complaining about elk taking their grass. So the herd grew to something like 400 elk on this spit of land surrounded by Tomales Bay in the ocean. But during this epic drought, they, there's not a natural stream or creek. There were old stock ponds because it was a former dairy. That's one of the few dairies that actually left the Pierce Point Ranch. The buildings are still there. They're historic. So these stock ponds dried up, and the little tiny seeps and springs also did not provide enough water. So there was a huge die-off of about 200, 220 elk. It was a mass die-off. And that terrible. caused an outrage. Yeah, it was terrible. And it actually woke local environmental groups up to the fact that, well, wait a minute. The, the cows have plenty of water right over the fence. The cows didn't die. No cow died. Dairies, tons of water wells pumping water into stock ponds, um, creeks, streams. You know, they made sure they had plenty of water. So that actually launched a lawsuit, and I think it was initiated by the Marin Group Resource Renewal Institute, and they asked Western Watersheds Project to join in and Center for Biological Diversity. So in 2016, um, this lawsuit was going on, and it I wasn't with the groups at the time, but what ended up was they settled with the park and the ranchers to say, well, look, let's do a better plan for this and um, do a new general management plan for the park and the seashore so that we can make sure we don't mismanage elk. And, you know, maybe we ought to look at this this whole ranching issue because it's actually kind of degrading the land we're discovering. So that's actually where we are now. It took a couple years, but it's, we have just, We're at the closing of an environmental impact statement that um, chooses different alternatives on a new general management plan, an amendment to the plan, that will guide how the seashore is managed for the next 30 years. And the bad part of this is I came in two years ago and started looking at this and realized, you know, oh, my gosh, this is these cattle have actually been hugely degrading the seashore. You know, and we drive by it, and we're so used to seeing that in California on private land that we kind of don't realize how bad it's gotten because nobody's really been looking or watching. So there were several alternatives that under the National Environmental Policy Act you choose. Um, That's the law that this environmental impact statement is following. And there was a good alternative. It was called the conservation alternative, where the Park Service actually said, well, in this alternative, we would remove all the cows, like the original legislation intended. They already got their money, you know, time to go. And then we would restore, you know, this 18,000 acres of seashore back to a natural state. And so, of course, that's the alternative we all wanted. And then there were some other alternatives that said, well, the 
dairies are actually pretty hard on the land, use a lot of water. So we'll just, this alternative will convert dairies into beef. We'll let the ranchers stay, but they have to do beef cows. But then the, the alternative that they actually preferred, it's actually called their preferred alternative, um, was the worst one. It actually expanded ranching. It said all beef and dairy cows can stay. You ranchers will let you stay for 20 years in a lease and just keep renewing it every 20 years instead of five years. Rubber stamp you. And because apparently the ranchers lobbied the Department of Interior in the park that it's quite an economically hard thing to do to dairy you know there's a milk glut a lot of people are going vegan now so that's kind of a hard thing to make a profit with beef and dairy so they actually are allowing the park service is allowing these ranchers to diversify into chickens sheep goats row crops you know hey artichokes or something who knows um farm stays like an airbnb and now This is really a precedent, Senator, because these aren't concessions. These are this is actually public land, and these ranches were bought by taxpayer money. Like we own the houses, we own the barns. But these a few like twelve families who are actually quite intermarried too, we've discovered, are going to get to profit more off of public national park land. So but apparently that's the direction it's headed, and the final decision on this environmental impact statement is probably due out in January or February. So that's that's where we are. The Park Service is completely going the wrong way and just catering to 12 ranching families over, you know, millions of Americans and park visitors who would rather go see wildlife like tule elk instead of just more mud and cows. Well, okay. So just to review real quick here, they, there was a plan that this lovely area should be, get made into the equivalent of a national park. And so the private landowners who were there were not only offered, but actually paid uh, many millions of dollars and told that they had to leave within X number of years. And they didn't. They're still there. And now at this point, not only do they get to stay, but they get to expand their operations and they still have all that money. Correct. Yes. I mean, I find that, you know, enraging, frankly. Yeah, it's enraging a lot of us. Like the more we learn, the more we're like, wait a minute, I can't believe this has been going on for decades and that the Park Service is, you know, just bending over for these uh, commercial for-profit farmers. And, you know, I'm not against agriculture of course i'm not even against cows and ranching and farming but this is a little bit different because you go there and there's just so much greenwashing you know they say well we're organic we're um, grass-fed we're you know this the historic dairy properties that are such a valuable legacy in marin county but you go there and they have almost on the verge of factory farming levels of dairy cows. You know, I've read different numbers of what qualifies as a factory farm, but I mean, some of them will have 500 dairy cows stuffed into, you know, thousand acres. And the land is just hammered. It's just mud. And then at the end of summer, it's bare ground weeds, noxious invasive weeds. They don't do any rotation grazing. I mean, it's it's actually made me personally become not only not eating meat, but I don't eat, even eat dairy now because I've seen, wow, this is an organic dairy and it's having so much impact on the land. I mean, the 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 biggest eye opener for a dairy for me on on Point Reyes on our public land here was the sheer amount of manure that is produced and they have built modern dairy milking barns they actually call them loafing barns because the the cows apparently were not doing too well in the open on a stormy winter in point Reyes. you know the direct 
winter storm just comes crashing in on these pastures. So they have huge modern, at least two, loafing barns that are very large, state-of-the-art modern facilities where they, they keep the dairy cows in the winter storms. You know, that's good. It's good to take care of the cows. But um, then they basically just hose off the manure daily into a holding pond, which is outside. Oh, and no. you can go see it. It's just a brown, yeah, it's a brown liquid pond right next to a creek. And we've watched them. We have photos now of them. The dairies take water trucks and pump the liquefied manure into these water trucks and then they go spray the manure onto the fields um the pastures and the the cattle rangelands on the park and so and this is called carbon farming by the way it's it's a greenwashing term where you know we're putting carbon back into the soil but what really happens is these pastures are already so degraded and compacted and trampled by too many cows in one place fenced that they during the first winter storm a lot of this manure that has not soaked into the ground washes into the creeks and into the ocean and the park service in the past has actually had to close beaches because of high fecal coliform levels that are a human health hazard and you learn this and you're like whoa I can't believe this is a national park and they're just letting this happen. And the park will claim, oh, we're trying to clean this up better. And, you know, the we have better ways. We're trying to make buffers so that, you know, things don't get into the creek as much. And But it's apparently still happening. It's just amazing. In a state of shock after the war. We interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. And now, back to our regularly scheduled... And as for the the beef cattle that's there, is this what uh, you would call free-range no, they're not free range. They're they're fenced. And this is another thing I just learned that there's about 300 miles of barbed wire fence in our national seashore. And this is actually kind of an access issue. You know, we're very much concerned about um, equitable access to our public lands. I mean, we're just all much more aware of this now. And I mean, how many people would like to park on the side of the road and then to get to the beach, you have to climb over or through three barbed wire fences and navigate your way around herds of cows. And not a lot of people are going to do that. So this has become kind of an issue that, you know, Point Reyes National Seashore was apparently formed as a large natural park in a metropolitan area that would actually serve urban core people and low-income communities. And so they purposefully made the entrance fee free. It's actually one of the you know, crown jewels of the National Park Service that's free. There's no entrance fee. You know, other parks are like $40 to get into now, like Grand Canyon. Oh, that's impressive for sure. Yeah. So there's, you know, the beef cows are fenced into pastures and also overstocked and not rotated. And so you look at their pastures and they're just gullies of erosion. There's just head cuts in streams that are pouring sediment into these salmon streams. So the, I mean, very clearly the cows just don't belong in an area like this. Yeah. what It's amazing to me after spending a couple of years doing field trips and looking at You know, I'm not going to the pretty places in Point Reyes. I'm going to the cow pastures. And I have become amazed that the management of this national park unit is actually worse than Bureau of Land Management land that has cows or Forest Service grazing allotments. I mean, the goal, the mission of the National Park Service 
is supposed to be the highest level of protection for cultural and natural resources. And I'm finding Point Reyes National Seashore to be among the worst managed. I mean, it's just illegal to me. That's really saying something. I mean, I've personally, and I know you have too, seen some really nasty examples of damage on BLM and National Forest land from ranching. Yeah, so I think it's it's a case where people have just allowed, I mean, the public has allowed the ranchers and the National Park Service to just get away with this for way too long. And now we're forming quite a grassroots coalition of people who are, I mean, I'm really happy because now that we're kind of under a travel lockdown i can't get out there but we have local people who are able to just you know take their bicycle and go in and the seashore is not closed so they can take photographs and email me and so we're creating a library of photos documenting the damage the cows are doing and it's it's like i said i mean it's just weeds poison hemlock and but, I mean, they do so much more. I mean, I, I'm amazed that I never even noticed this. But the park just doesn't – the park, unfortunately, has been quite on the side of the ranchers. And I'm not sure why that is. It might just be a, you know, a history of leaning over backwards for the local powerful politicians. And, you know, the, the ranching families, I think, have some political power. Unfortunately, Diane Feinstein is pro-ranching. Uh, Jared Huffman, pro-ranching. We've met with him multiple times. He assures us the cattle are here to stay. So the ranchers have just had a lot of politicians on their side. And But you go there and back to the dairy cows, they need so much food. They're lactating female animals that need tons of calories. I mean, I've heard it that uh, a lactating female needs as much calories as like an Olympic athlete. And especially if you're being, I don't know if these dairy cows are fed hormones, but we do see very large udders on some of these cows. So I, I wonder what's allowed. But so they're constantly producing milk, need tons of calories. And long ago, they have grazed off those lush coastal prairies that were there before during the Miwok time. They're mostly gone. I go there and I'll find a tiny little fragment a couple of acres of the original coastal prairie on the other side of a fence or a far corner where the cows don't graze the grazing the, the huge numbers of heavy cows have just eliminated the coastal prairie so now it's mostly weedy european mediterranean annual grasses like rip gut brome and hair barley and foxtail and they have very shallow roots, and they're annual. They only live in the spring. They die off in the summer. I mean, they start sprouting in the winter, but they're not that nutritious. And, you know, they're eaten up pretty quickly. So the park actually has to truck in tons of alfalfa hay into the park to feed these dairy cows. And you see the trucks, and you see the hay stacked up. And then they also grow fields of what's called silage in the park on our public lands they they're allowed to grow hundreds of acres of and I've, i had to go look at this stuff and figure out what it was it's basically mustard radish field pea and grains like rye wheat and then they mow this and it, it's a kind of a moist hay that's what silage is and they just feed that to the dairy cows so you have this whole ancillary agricultural industrial operation going on to support these dairies and probably the the beef cows have to be supplemented too a little bit especially now there's a drought going on again but this i just don't think this level of modern commercial agriculture should be allowed in a national park which was supposed to be made for the rest restoration of wildlife and you know recreation and public enjoyment but that, that's where we are. Yeah, no, I think that a lot of people would agree with you. And, and I think that most uh, U.S. Americans are not aware of how ravaged a lot of our public lands are from uh, ranching and from timber and mining and all that. Most people assume that a national forest is a protected thing, whereas a national forest is really just a resource 
management tool is what it is. And, and, you know, of course, as you said, the national parks, these are supposed to be the highest level of preservation. So that's why it's particularly obscene here. I wanted to just make a quick note about the uh, aspect of the damage that is shown by all the annual weeds that are there. And just mentioned that this is, of course, one of the results of agriculture is that you have uh, landscapes that are constantly kept at the earliest level of succession of annuals and pioneer species. And that always forcing them to be there means that there's never going to be a full recovery. And so once the, the cows were removed, and if things were actually just even just ignored at first, there would be some healing that would original, that would eventually happen just because as the as the annuals come in and do their job, then you'd have the next levels of succession that would start to come in too. And eventually those wouldn't be in there anymore. They would be crowded out by the next set of plants that would be coming in. That would be more like your forbs or your woody shrubs and that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's there's levels of succession from the early pioneering, you know, weeds that are adapted. They're from Europe and they're adapted adapted to cattle herds and fences over 10,000 years. And we see that in some of the the worst hit um, areas. You have milk thistle, bull thistle, poison hemlock. I mean, just all sorts of really noxious weeds that are adapted to not even be eaten by cows. So, but the Tamales Elk Reserve is a good example of that succession where the Pierce Point Dairy was bought out and they 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 are gone. They actually left. Um, and tule elk are there, lightly grazing. I've recently read that one tule elk adult um, is the equivalent. Actually, three elk make up one cow in the level of forage and damage. That's how much. I mean, the tule elk are actually a very small subspecies of elk. So you know they weigh 400 pounds, maybe a little more. And our dairy cows weigh 1,500 pounds, 1,200. A bull can weigh almost a ton. So it's there's a lot less impact with the tule elk. So the Pierce Point Ranch is recovering. You go there and the noxious weeds are gone, and there's now a carpet of the annual grasses and no bare ground. You don't see the bare ground. The, the coyote brush and other native shrubs are beginning to come back. And so there's more of a mosaic of community for different birds and cottontail rabbits and things. And I even occasionally find a native bunch grass here and there. I mean, I think they can recover. And if the park could remove the cows and actually get volunteer crews, they could more actively plant in the native bunch grasses to help restore these cow damaged pastures. I mean, there's passive restoration where you just let nature reseed itself and come in but some active restoration could be done and there are plenty of people who like doing that kind of thing too so there there's a lot of options that could be done to even speed up some of the succession back to a coastal prairie in some of these areas Yes, well, in the best case scenario where we do get rid of the cows, I hope that allies will not use herbicides on the non-native weeds. Absolutely. I am completely against herbicides, pesticides. I mean, we have so many sensitive, rare species here, like, you know, the California freshwater shrimp, the salmon, the steelhead. There's a um, rare butterfly. There's actually federally listed butterflies that live here on the coastal prairie. So yes, this being that this is national park unit, you know, we would like to have it um, be as sustainably restored as possible. Now, uh, one thing also that you haven't mentioned yet, but that I was hearing about this year was that there were actually plans to shoot some of the elk in the park. Yes. That's another outrage of this preferred alternative in the EIS is that, because there are, well, the history of this is that because it was a goal to restore the seashore back to a natural state, a um, couple of decades ago, some of the elk at the, the fenced Tamales Elk Reserve were um, actually, I think, helicoptered over to Drake's Bay and released and to form a free roaming herd. 
And the idea, I think this was 20 years ago as well, we're just going to allow the elk to expand out. And um, there's a big part of the seashore it is actually wilderness that's not grazed, fortunately, and the elk were put there. And they actually are doing quite well. There's two, their lemon tour herd and the Drake's beach herd. I think it's, you know, each about 100 animals. But then a problem arose. The elk in their migrations around this area crossed over, jumped over the barbed wire fences into the cow pastures. And the cat, the ranchers got mad and complained to the park service, well, this grass is our grass, and the elk are stealing our grass. So this is actually, once again, the park service, for some reason, is choosing cows over native wildlife and agreeing that, okay, we'll have to reduce these herds, the free-roaming herds, so they don't get to, you know, enter into the cow pastures too much. And so we'll haze them out. And we don't know what haze means. Does that mean get your um, ATV and, you know, yell and scream and drive get, and scare them away? But, but also lethal removal is included in the preferred alternative, which means shoot a couple of elk a year until they're down to a, a level that the park wants. And this is just outrageous to us. Like they'll have to close public access roads for safety when they get, you know, whoever they're going to get, wildlife services or, you know, contract somebody to, you know, take their rifle and actually shoot native wildlife in a national park. I mean, I've just never seen this before. Even in Yellowstone, you know, the bison will exit the park boundary and then be shot, but not inside the park. So again, Point Reyes National Seashore is creating huge horrible precedents for how we manage these special areas. So the elk shooting hasn't started yet. It's just part of the preferred alternative preferred by the park service for the new general, what did you call it? The, um, yeah, the general management plan amendment. Yeah. And the, and the process is the EIS, the environmental impact statement. And the, the decision is called the record of decision, which will come out, um, like I said, January, February, and that's the final decision. And the day after, they can go shoot elk. Wow. So is that process still at the stage where they're taking public comment? or? Unfortunately not. That ended a couple of months ago. And so we're in this kind of waiting period where the Park Service is making sure they're consistent with different laws like California Fish and, Ga Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, California Coastal Commission. Um, so, I mean, there's a kind of a, to me, a little technical, I don't know if it's uh, going, it won't stop this decision. I mean, people could write to the California Coastal Commission. They, they're taking public comments on whether the parks plan, their general management plan preferred alternative is consistent with the California Coastal Zone Protection Act or Conservation Act. So, I mean, a bunch of people are writing into that, and I think I think we have that pretty covered. I mean, I, I think the the best thing we can do is just learn about this and try to spread the word about, you know, we shouldn't be managing a park unit like this. Right, right. And so did you hear anything about what the comments were like that were submitted already? Did they tell you, oh, this was how many were in favor of each of the alternatives or...? Yeah, you know, we actually, our grassroots team spent a lot of time, I mean, I'm really thankful they did this, and they actually kind of analyzed, there were something like 7,000 comments received by the public, and they counted them, and, you know, even tallied them into different categories, and something like 90, it was a little over 90% of the comments favored the wildlife, and you know, not necessarily, there's people that wanted mountain bike trails more and, you know, so it was sort of a, it's not they were against ranching, but 90% of comments favored access, wildlife, nature, and the park being a park and not the alternative that just keeps fences and cattle and all that. I mean, there's a, different categories. A lot of people said, no, we don't want cows. 
quite a lot of people said, we support the Thule elk. We don't want them to be shot. But I mean, only 10% of comments said, yeah, we want ranching and to shoot elk. So overwhelming support by the public of restoring the seashore. And we'll tell this to, you know, Representative Huffman, and he just doesn't believe it. So I think the more we educate people and get people writing Congress, I think the better. Huffman is the congressional representative in the House? Yes. Okay. Okay. I read recently that a new park superintendent is going to be coming in soon. His name is Craig Kirkle, I believe it is. And do you know anything about him or whether that's a, a good thing or not? Yeah, yeah, we were looking into him. I don't know him, but his past is a little bit troubling because they're bringing him from Cuyahoga. I don't know how to pronounce that national park in Ohio. And that's what they're doing is saying that's a signal from the National Park Service that has cultural farmsteads in Cuyahoga Valley as part of the park. They lease it to these farmers. And th what they're basically saying is, well, we're just going to double down on keeping agriculture in this park because look, we've done it at Cuyahoga. But you look at Cuyahoga and it's completely different. They're like really trying to look historic. I mean, they're little historic farmsteads with, you know, and they, they will sell their produce to the public, but they're not giant agro factory farm dairies with super modern equipment. So I think it, there's a different approach here. And I, I think that the superintendent's not going to be on our side. Right. And then are we at a place in the process where we are just waiting or could the incoming presidential administration have some effect on the outcome? I'm actually hopeful that the Biden um, administration will be perhaps a little bit more open to the angle that, OK, yes, I mean, we want to help um, jobs and agriculture and farms and all that. But this the seashore was meant to be accessible to everybody. And, you know, they're going to actually increase barbed wire fencing up to 340 miles. So and there's no plans for new interpretive facilities or new trails to the beach. So I'm, I'm hoping that they might be a little bit more open to, you know, this is supposed to be an accessible park and not just a commercial big ag area that you see. I mean, I even tried to count and tally how many acres is devoted to um, private dairy in Marin in Sonoma County. And, you know, looking through all the county records, it's it's easily like 150,000 acres of private dairy land in this region. And we're just talking about 18,000 acres of dairy and beef in Point Reyes National Seashore. That's it. It's not going to have an economic hit. I mean, the, a lot and a lot of the dairies and beef owners have private land already. They have multiple properties and they're just, you know, some of them are even tenant farmers on these parcels that they don't even live there anymore. So we'll see. I mean, it's the Biden administration to me partly looks like they're going to just do the same old, you know, management that we've unfortunately seen, like the, the pick of Vilsack. Is it John Vilsack? Yeah. Very troubling. Very troubling. He was the CEO of a dairy export company for the last four years. So I don't think we're going to get any help from him. Now, he's pro-GMO. He's, he's pro-big ag. He's anti-small farm. He, you know, you know, he has connections to Monsanto. He's really... Yeah. He's totally bad news, and and no, I don't, I don't think he'll. But I mean, that's that's the Department of Ag. So the Park Service that's under the Department of Interior. Interior, right? And so we're actively waiting for, um, yeah, the Interior pick. It'll be interesting to see. Right now, there's been a lot of wildfires, obviously in California the last few years, and I believe there was one at Point Reyes this last summer too. Yeah, the, the Woodward fire, and it actually burned in the wilderness area, and some of our observers went out, and it's, it's out now, 
And apparently it's been actually a good fire. We had a fire ecologist tell us that, well, you know, this is actually what we should have been doing a lot, a prescribed burn program, because the Woodward fire, which was, excuse me, caused by lightning strike, um, imitated the prior Miwok land management of cultural burning. I mean, the Miwok for thousands of years probably were doing cultural burns all over Point Reyes, which kept the grasslands, the prairies open, renewed um, any decadent shrubland or forest, didn't kill vegetation because it's usually just a kind of a, a cool, slow-moving surface fire. So apparently the Woodward fire didn't kill a lot of trees, but it's regrowing already with some of the rains and apparently it was a, actually a good renewing fire that's good to hear yeah i mean obviously that's a whole nother subject is the mismanagement of lands in regard to fire uh, over the last century but it's good to hear that something uh, went right there in, in the wilderness area right but the other interesting thing is we had a bit of an extreme one-year drought this summer and there were reports of elk dying again behind the fence in that Tamales Reserve, where they don't really have good water. So we've been all questioning the park and um, even sending a FOIA request to the park, but they're just really stonewalling us and saying, everything's okay, we're, we're managing the elk just fine. So it's it's been an eye-opening experience to see how not on the side of wildlife or visitors, the park service is there, the the local management so it's they're just um set in their ways that they're going to keep helping the agriculture industry there on public land voices for nature and peace is produced in the gila river valley new mexico usa on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied apache territory the intro music is zero g yogi by big z with narration by kelly moody of the ground shots podcast this outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit RadioFreeSunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.